Yeah, we, we feel like that too. So. So good, mo good morning everybody and welcome to this IPCC press conference to present our special report Climate Change and Land which was approved and accepted yesterday. We've got um, almost the entire uh, scientific leadership of the IPCC and more here with you to present the report and I'll introduce you to them starting from the far end, the right as I see it, the left as you do. Um, Valerie Masson Delmotte, who is a co chair of Working Group One, which deals with the physical science basis of climate change. Then um, Pan Mao Jai, the other co chair of Working Group One. Then Jim Ski, co chair of Working Group Three, which deals with the mitigation of climate change. Priyadarshi Shukla, the other co chair of Working Group Three. Then Abdallah Moxit, the secretary of the IPCC. Helena Manainkova, the Deputy Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization, which is one of our two parent organizations along with the UN Environment Program and is the host of today's uh, meeting. Then um, Yuba Sokana, who is one of the three vice chairs of the IPCC and is the report champion for this report. Then Hans Otto Pertner, co-chair of Working Group 2, which deals with impacts, adaptation and vulnerability of, of climate change. Then Eduardo Calvo Buendia, co-chair of the task force on national greenhouse gas inventories. Deborah Roberts, the other co-chair of Working Group 2. Kyoto Tanabe, co-chair, the other co-chair of the Task Force on National Greenhouse Gas Inventories and Kyoto may have to leave um, early for another appointment. Um, so uh, some of you may be following this, uh, r this uh, press conference uh, remotely. It's available on facebook.com slash IPCC and uh, we will be taking questions after the initial presentation. We'll be taking questions both from the floor in here and remotely through um, the application Slido. So if you're following this press conference remotely, go to sli.do, Slido, on, um, on the web, and then you choose the event code SRCCL, which is the abbreviation and hashtag for this report, SRCCL. You can submit questions that way. And if you do submit questions remotely, please make sure you give your name. So with that, I will hand over to um, Yuba Sokana, Vice Chair of the IPCC, to kick off the presentation. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. The IPCC decided at its uh, 43rd session in Nairobi, Kenya, in April 2016 to prepare this special report after member country states, member states and observer organizations were asked to submit views on potential theme for special report during the current sixth assessment report cycle. Nine clusters were considered on different themes, including land, cities, and oceans. The special report on climate change and land represents the second largest cluster 
and covers seven proposals from member states and observer organizations that are related to land. Over two years in the making, the special report on climate change and land explores how the way we use our land contributes to climate change and how climate change affects our land. This special report was prepared by 107 lead or scientists from 52 countries across the regions of the world who acted as coordinating lead author, lead authors, and review editors. 40% of the coordinating lead author are female. 52% of the authors are from developing countries, making this the first IPCC report to have more authors from developing countries than developed countries. Over 7,000 scientific publications were assessed in this report. The report received a total of 28,000 comments from experts, reviewers, and government. We'll hand over to the chair, Dr. Ho Sun Lee. Thank you, Yuba Sokona, Vice Chair of IPCC, and thank you. Thank you. Uh, today I'd like to turn to your attention to the cover uh, for the special report on special report on climate change and land, you will notice that it matches other uh, special report we produce uh, in this assessment cycle. Uh, for this uh, photograph, uh, it, this one was uh, sourced from uh, photographer the Jan uh, Yatos Bertrand. Uh, this was taken in Turkey, and this striking image shows land from above. This is very important in the context of the, this special report, as this image presents, represents a mixture of terrain and purposes that land has on our diverse planet. As Yuba Sokona, Vice Chair of PCC, uh, just tell, tell us, told us a few minutes ago that the governments, our member governments, 195 governments, asked and challenged IPCC to take the first ever comprehensive look at the whole land climate system. And this is the result we have received approval and acceptance by our member government yesterday. Before handing over to this report, the major two co-chairs, I'd like to present the high-level findings of this report. That is, land is where we live. Land is under growing human pressure, and land is part of the solution, but land cannot do it all. Valerie? Thank you, Hosung. Population growth and changes in consumption of food, feed, fiber, timber, and energy have caused unprecedented rates of land and freshwater use. We humans affect more than 70% of ice-free land. A quarter of this land is degraded. The way we produce food and what we eat contributes to the loss of natural ecosystems and declining biodiversity. When land is degraded, it reduces the soil's ability to take up carbon, and this exacerbates climate change. In turn, climate change exacerbates land degradation in many different ways. Today, 500 million people live in areas that experience desertification. People living in already degraded or desertified areas are increasingly negatively affected by climate change. Our next findings will now be reported by my fellow co-chair, Pan Maudrai. Thank you, Valerie. The temperature over the land surface have, in have increased almost twice the global average. Climate zones are shifting. Many extreme events, such as heat wave, drought, and heavy precipitation are becoming more frequent and intense. Increasing impacts on land are projected in the future as a result of water scarcity, wildfire, and the permafrost storing. 
in a warmer climate, the capacity of the land to store the carbon may be reduced. Despite increasing food production, an estimated 821 million people are undernourished. In cold regions, yields may temporarily benefit from warmer climate conditions. In general, climate change will cause declined yields, increased prices, reduced nutrition levels, and disruption in supply chains for food. Now I would like to hand over to my fellow co-chair, Edward Calvo. Uh, thank you, Bang Mao. Um, agriculture, forestry, and other uh, types of land use account for 23% of human greenhouse gas emissions. Deforestation, um, peatland burning, and wood harvest directly contribute to around 13% of human cost carbon dioxide emissions. The food system as a whole, which includes food, food production and processing, transport, retail consumption, loss and waste is currently responsible for up to a third of our global greenhouse gas emissions. And I will like to give the floor to my fellow co-chair, Jim. Okay, uh, th thanks, Eduardo. So improving the way that we use land and produce food does have an important part to play in helping us to tackle climate change. Limiting global warming to 1.5 or even 2 degrees will involve removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and land has a critical role to play in carbon dioxide removal. Agricultural practices can help build up carbon in soils, but it could also mean using more bioenergy, with or without carbon capture and storage, and expanding forests. 25 to 30 per cent of food produced is lost or wasted, and reducing food loss and waste can reduce pressure on land, improve food security, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. At the same time, a move to more balanced diets could help us adapt to and limit climate change. Some diets require more land and water and lead to higher emissions than others. For example, diets that are high in grains, nuts and vegetables have a lower carbon footprint than those that are high in meat and they lead to better health outcomes. But of course, dietary choices are influenced by local production practices and cultural habits. And with that, I'll pass over to my friend Shukla. Thank you, Jim. But there are things we can do to both tackle land degradation and prevent or adapt to further climate change. Vegetation and soils absorb one third of carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels and industry. Sustainable land management can improve the amount of emissions that soils and vegetation absorb and sometimes reverse the adverse impacts of climate change. Diverse agricultural systems reduce both the economic and environmental risks related to land degradation. There are ways to prevent vulnerabilities that come from the negative impacts that climate change, climate can have on our land and food. I now hand over to Hans. Thank you very much, Shukla. We are best placed to tackle climate change in a world with an overall focus on sustainability. This means low population growth and reduced inequalities, improved nutrition, and lower food waste. Early action to reduce emissions means less land needed for bioenergy or for afforestation. Policies outside of land are therefore important and can make a critical difference, for example, concerning energy, transport, and the environment. There are things we are already doing that can be scaled up or used elsewhere. The food system has the potential to adapt to climate change and avoid additional risks by diversifying. 
There are ways to manage land and reduce risks for ecosystems and people, and clearly early action is the most cost effective. Climate change creates additional stresses on land, exacerbating existing risks to livelihoods, ecosystems, species, and biodiversity. Near-term actions to promote sustainable land management will help reduce the loss of biodiversity also through restoring natural ecosystems and their capacity to store carbon. Indigenous and local knowledge can contribute to overcoming the combined challenges of climate change, biodiversity loss, food security, desertification, and land degradation. And with that, I hand over to my fellow co-chair, Deborah Roberts. Thanks so much, Hans. Drivers of land use decisions come from both the regional and international pressures. Regional cooperation is therefore vital. Trade in food can be an important way to relieve local risks to food security and from climate change impact. Some regions, countries and communities have a limited capacity to deal with the negative impacts of climate change. Therefore, the right mix of policies make all the difference if we are to achieve sustainable development. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions from all sectors is essential if we want to keep below 2 degrees Celsius. There are, however, limits to the scale of energy crops and afforestation that could be used to achieve this goal. It also takes time for trees and soils to store carbon effectively. Better land management can release agricultural land for afforestation and bioenergy so as not to impact on food security. Careful management of bioenergy will also avoid risks to food security, biodiversity and land degradation. So let me repeat the three messages our chairs stressed at the beginning of this presentation. Land is under growing human pressure. Land is part of the solution, but land cannot do it all. And now I hand back to Jonathan Lynn to supervise the Q&A session. Thank, thank you, Deborah. And, and the fact that we have so many people on the podium today presenting this report is because this is the, only the second special report that the IPCC has prepared with all three of the IPCC working groups. And it's the first one that we've done with all three working groups and the cooperation of the, the Task Force and National Greenhouse Gas Inventors. And what that signifies is it, sh it shows how the work we're doing at the moment is highly integrated across different disciplines and, and sectors. So with that, we'll move on to the, the Q&A. And um, if, if you're in the room and want to ask a question, please raise your hand. And if you're selected, you need to press the, the little button with a, a speaking mouth and waves coming out of it. And uh, please then say uh, who, who you are, uh, what, what medium you represent, and who you would like to direct your question to, if any, or, or generally. If you're following this remotely, you can submit questions through Slido, so going online, sli.do and then entering the event code SRCCL, short for Special Report on Climate Change and Land, and please give your name when you submit a question. So any, any questions in, in the room now? Gentlemen there. Hi. Hello? Hi, uh, Patrick Daly from AFP News Agency. Um, this is a question for anyone on the panel who uh, may have some insight. The final summary for policymakers yesterday, um, the one that arrived last night, is a fair bit longer than the one that you guys arrived with. There's also quite a lot of paragraphs with low to medium confidence. I just wondered if you could outline a little bit of what was added um, and why there may be so many things with low or medium confidence uh, in the summary for policymakers, and do you fear that that may water down its message? Th thanks. And Jim, would you like to start off with that? Yeah, in, in terms of, of why uh, the, the uh, summary for policymakers lengthens slightly, the characteristics of this report, you can tell by the long title, 
just the, the huge scope of the report. And one of the overarching messages we would have from it is that many of the solutions in the land select sector are very regionally and locally specific. And as we sat in this room for five days with countries from all parts of the world, of course, everybody wanted an appropriate reference to their particular problem that they were facing. So you can see in there that there are many, many sort of lists uh, included in the points. And that ref really reflects the discussions that we had. We had to identify which were the most important parts to pick out uh, and pull it there. The other thing is, I think with this report being very interdisciplinary, which Jonathan uh, mentioned, it meant that there were many scientific communities involved in the report. You will also note that there are quite a lot of footnotes with definitions in them. And it was only through the use of these painfully discussed footnotes that we were able to get that communication between the different scientific communities. So I think that's the explanation for your first question. And I think IPCC reports have always had medium confidence in them. We have always uh, been required in producing these confidence levels to take careful consideration about the amount of literature that's out there. So if there isn't a huge literature if it's a sort of medium size, we will come up with medium confidence. And frankly, it, you know, it's, it reflects an honest appraisal of the literature that we had to assess, uh, given the guidance that we've given to ourselves on how to, to grade the, these confidence levels. Uh, thanks, Valerie. I just wanted to stress the fact that the approval session showed how much government delegates cared for every aspect of the underlying chapters. So they asked to provide more details, bringing scientific information that was present in the underlying chapters. And also they asked to add two bullet points related to cities, which are important for many people in this planet. Thanks. I have a couple of questions from outside, so I'll take um, Uma Irfan of Vox. Um, and the new report doesn't look at urban ecosystem dynamics in detail, but it does note that urbanization can exacerbate warming and diminish cropland. Could the authors elaborate on how the growth of cities and urbanization is expected to impact climate and food security, and how we can mitigate harm? And I think Deborah might want to look at that. Thanks so much, Jonathan. As Valerie indicated, the uh, representatives of the countries who gathered in this room over the, the last week or so uh, considered all aspects of land and raised very vociferously that one of the big mega trends of the century is urbanization. And that's the reason that we see an additional bullet point coming forward, really looking at the interaction between that mega trend and the use of land for productive uses such as food security and so on. It, there's also an existing bullet point which refers to the fact that climate change will exacerbate warming trends that are already exist in cities because of the way that we build them. The reason that cities are, are not covered fully in this report is it's anticipated that we will have a special report on cities in the seventh assessment cycle, and the important building block towards that major product is in fact the main assessment report. So if we look at working group one, two, and three, there's a much more heightened focus on cities in the main assessment reports, which will call out the relationship between urban, climate change, and sustainable development in more detail. Thanks. Uh, questions in the room? Uh, the gentleman there. Laurent Ciro, Swiss News Agency. Uh, question to anyone on the panel who would like to, to answer. Um, so you recommend the change in diets. Some NGOs say uh, we should reduce the consumption of meat up to 50%. I was wondering whether you have a threshold, a similar threshold uh, that make consensus now uh, in that regard. And maybe a quick question to uh, Chairman Hussung Lee. Um, the next meeting where the states are supposed to come with policy announcement at 2020, uh, but there will be that summit in New York in September. Uh, do you think that the member states can afford to uh, delay the announcement in 2020, or should they come to New York already with, uh, with some announcements? 
maybe Jim wants to start on the diet question. Yeah, yeah, just on, on the diets, I should absolutely emphasise that uh, IPCC does not recommend people's diets. That is very clear. The words are chosen very carefully. Uh, what we've pointed out on the basis of the scientific evidence is that there are certain types of diets that have a lower carbon footprint and put le less pressure on land. Obviously, in the summary for policymakers, that's done at a very high level. If you go down into the underlying chapters of the report, you will find find much more detail on the greenhouse gas footprints of individual types of diet. But we were very careful in our introduction to spell out uh, that uh, dietary choices are very often shaped or influenced by local production practices and factors and cultural habits. And I think, uh, you know, given IPCC's remit, we don't do recommendations. We produce the evidence for the policymakers. We've been very careful to stick to that side of the line. Regarding the uh, policy use of this report, uh, I, I want to report to you that the, uh, we, this report will be uh, conveyed to the, the major findings of this report will be conveyed to the uh, UN Convention to combat the desertification, the COP14 that will be held in the September in New Delhi, as well as to the, uh, the UN Secretary General's Climate Summit that will be held in New York, September. Thank you. More questions? The yeah, over there, please. No, oh, okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Apologies for that. David Shuckman, BBC News. Just to follow up the question about diet, I understand what you're saying, that you're not recommending what people should do. Given the science that you lay out about the impacts, potentially the benefits of moving to more of a plant-based diet, I'm wondering whether the panel has given up meat or is reducing its own consumption of meat. <laughs> Who would like to talk well, about maybe... Well... Jim, and then I can perhaps, yeah, I'll leave it to you to decide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this discussion, just to say, this discussion is not new, and the new generation has been picking, picking this up and is challenging the established modes of life, and this happens in family. So have, have everybody here who has family with young kids will be exposed and I hope they will be, if, if not yet, exposed to challenging questions concerning traditional habits. And I can tell you from my point of view that um, I have lost weight, I have <laughs> reduced meat consumption, and if I wouldn't have done so, I would be in trouble. <laughs> I think the question might be more relevant as who has reduced meat consumption, because we're, we're not talking about giving up meat in this report at all. Yeah, could I say, David, some of us on the panel probably don't eat meat at all in the first place. <laughs> right. Okay, Valerie, did you want to say something like that? Yeah, I wanted to stress the fact that our report puts an emphasis on solutions. And when you, when you look at food systems, there are many actors involved in these solutions. There are solutions in the hands of farmers. There are solutions in the hands of each of us when we buy the food and we prepare food at home and we avoid wasting food as well. So it's, it's I think, putting an emphasis on the diversity of solutions that are there and you can see the mitigation potential if all these solutions are deployed together. I think that's the most important message of our report. Okay. I, so any, uh, yes. Uh, 
So Roger Harabin from BBC, just staying on uh, this theme. It's a technical question about meat production. Uh, we have um, sheep farmers in the UK saying, or beef farmers in the UK saying, we have extensive beef herds, uh, we have low emissions of CO2, therefore it's good to eat our beef. We also have intensive farmers saying, we may have high CO2 emissions, but our cattle grow more quickly, therefore they die earlier, therefore they burp less methane, therefore we are better for greenhouse gas emissions. Does the panel have a view? Uh, uh, Jim, yes. Yeah, if, if I could come in on this, and, and it may be one that, that Eduardo, who's from the inventory side, uh, may, may want to address. But one of the, one of the problems is what you, how we actually measure and estimate emissions from the farming sector. And it's easy for energy. You take the tons of coal and multiply it by a number or whatever. Land is much more complex. And at the moment, we don't have inventories that really truly reflect and many countries, the kind of diet that li livestock use, uh, the type of production systems that are in place, which your question really highlights. And I think the big challenge, if we're moving forward in the policy world, is to do it on a better evidence base so that farmers are better informed and incentivized about the kind of production systems that they actually use. But I, I, my colleague Eduardo from the inventory side may want to follow that one up because he knows farmers more than I do. Uh, thank, thank you, Jim. Uh, we, uh, from the inventory side, uh, what we, uh, the w way we work is to uh, calculate using activity data and emissions factors that are relevant. Those uh, are coming from scientific literature, the uh, emissions factors, and the uh, activity data is coming from the, for example, in this particular case, from the agricultural census. So we are depending on uh, these two things, in to have the relevant and highly disaggregated uh, data and to be able to find the most proper uh, emission factors that will reflect when they are combined the reality of what is happening. We have an emission factor database publicly available in the National Greenhouse Gas Inventory Pro uh, Program web page where you are able to find if uh, the relevant emission factor uh, reflecting the reality of uh, any group of um, uh, farmers, in particular the cattle raisers, is now uh, reflected. And uh, it, the, it, we depend on what the agricultural census have, and they provide uh, uh, the, in, the, uh, in their national inventories that are as you know, reviewed not by the IPCC, but by the U United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in a peer-reviewed manner. Thank you for the question. Yeah, Deborah. I think the important thing about this report is it continues the story of the special report on 1.5. And that really said, we have to look at a solution spectrum that is all in. Um, we shouldn't be focusing in on specific sectors, but look across sectors and all options to develop the appropriate responses that are appropriate to our context. And an important element of this report is it calls out the global food system. So instead of focusing on farmers in a specific sector, it really calls on us to think across the entire food production chain from before the farm, in the farm gate, after the farm gate, the way we handle it, and how there may be inequities across that system in the world um, in terms of the ability to handle food, reduce waste. And so it's a complex picture, and I think that's an important message from this report, is there's no single silver bullet 
It means that we're going to have to tackle a number of complex issues in complex areas where people have different needs and different perceptions. And so it really requires us to all be hands-on, to understand our local context, what our options are, and ultimately what choices we make across that range of solutions that Valerie spoke about. So it, it really encourages encourages engagement from everyone at every level to consider the options and make their choices. Hoisin. Thank you. As co-chair has mentioned, the IPCC uh, does not uh, prescribe the, what dietary choices uh, need, uh, need be to uh, uh, acquire the, this uh, cl uh, climate uh, goals. Uh, dietary choices is one of the choices the uh, consumer makes. It's consumer preference. It's a matter related to consumer preferences. Those consumer preferences is dependent upon the incentive structure, as just explained here, as well as the values cultural, social values that we live where we face, and also the infrastructure, technologies. And therefore, the dietary choices is not just simply a matter of behavioral choice, one individual versus another person's, uh, another person's preference. We need to look at this in terms of incentives we face, value systems we face, and infrastructure we face. Thank you, Valerie. Yeah, and I would like to come back to the content of the report. And with respect to livestock, the report shows that different farming and pastoral systems can achieve reductions in the emissions intensity of livestock products. And there are multiple options for that. Better grazing land management, improved manure management, higher quality feed, use of breeds and genetic improvement. And that shows that for each sector there is a potential for action and there are different options to do that. Thank you. Question from uh, Jamie Keeson, AP. Good morning, Jamie, Associated Press. I have uh, two questions. Um, the first is, um, I'm not really sensing the, the level of alarm that you have. I mean, how concerned are you about the situation? As I understand the report, um, the temperature of land has already increased by 1.5 degrees centigrade already since the industrial period. Um, so how concerned are you about that? And then the second is, you mentioned diet about what people can do and about what farmers can do, but what are your prescriptions for policy makers, specifically for policy makers, for governments? What can they do? I know that there's no one size fits all option, but what can you say generally that governments should be doing? Thank you. Maybe Jim, would you like to start with that? Well, per perhaps the working group two colleagues would be best to, to deal with, with the alarm side of it. But you know, in terms of um, you, you know how we how we do it, we have a section D in the summary for policymakers, which is specifically about action in the in the near term. And in section C of the summary for policymakers, we really we, we have long, long lists of specific kinds of policies that can be put in place to enable the kind of actions that we've been talking about uh, in the responses to the previous questions. And we set out a pretty clear case in, in uh, Section D about why action in the near term may be beneficial. I mean, first of all, there are some things we need to do now to prepare ourselves for actions in the longer term. That includes building up, filling in knowledge gaps, early warning systems, etc. There are many co-benefits in terms of sustainable development from taking actions in the land sector that will help food security, uh, help to eliminate hunger. And finally, in, the, in the, the final section of that section D on near-term action, we flag out the consequences of not taking action or deferring action on greenhouse gas emission reduction. So we've set out fairly clearly the case. And I think, uh, you know, section C and D of the summary for policymakers print contain a real menu of options, since we're talking about food, that, uh, that policymakers can choose from. And if we dive down into the individual chapters, there is actually much more detail available for policymakers. Uh, uh, Hans and then Valerie. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for this question. The motivation for taking action clearly comes out of the impacts that have been observed and that are projected into the future and that are related 
to the changes in, in global mean surface temperature. And that is the conventional approach by the IPCC that has also been taken up um, in, in the UNFCCC negotiations. So that puts the, the finding that the uh, land surface temperature has already been in increasing uh, to 1.5 and, and a little bit beyond into perspective because that is um, not watering down the message that is being uh, related to the global mean surface temperature, which is lower and which is driving the uh, negotiations. And, and this said, certainly, um, there we, we assess the level of risk of unpleasant uh, impacts to, uh, to occurring, to, uh, to be occurring, and, and we, uh, this, this is um, in, in relation to the velocity of climate change. Uh, putting urgency on the table for policy makers. Um, I would also like to emphasize that the present report on land is adding to all of the information that we have been el elaborating in the 1.5 report and it's specifying all of this for um, the, the land s sector. It's diversifying um, the solution options uh, that, that can be used and it doesn't take away the sense of urgency that has already been um, conveyed with the 1.5 report. Um, the response to the 1.5 report, I think, is illustrating uh, what it needs to make policy move, because policy has been identified as, as the bottleneck, the key bottleneck in, in the, in the storyline. Societal will has been building, and last and mostly through the mobilization of the young generation. And policymakers have been caught in, in surprise. Certainly my, my statements here are being, being biased towards the observations in, in my own country, but I think to some extent uh, we can generalize uh, uh, that. And this mobilization of society has influenced elections. So this is a motivation chain that works and that actually tells us that with all of what we are putting together, we need to reach not only the policy makers, but also society. And then the communication process within society does actually make action happen and increases the motivation to act. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just remind the, the co-chairs that we have many of the authors of the report in the room and feel free to pass uh, some of the questions on to them. So I think Valerie and then Deborah. Yeah, I want to strongly echo to Hans' points. We all care about future uh, living conditions for today's young people. And at around one degree of global warming, risks, for instance, for food supply instabilities are assessed in this report to be high and very high for around three, two degrees of global warming. The level associated with risk has been increased compared to past IPCC reports based on new knowledge and consistent knowledge across different disciplines. So why, why do we stress the need for near-term action in this report? It's different in the land sector. We don't rely on disruptive innovation. Practices, technologies exist. There are case studies that show they work. The challenge is to, is to scale them up. And why, does it, why, why is near-term action important in the land sector? Because in a warmer world, we lose the potential of some options, like the possibility of some <coughs> ecosystems or soil to store carbon. It also matters because um, it takes time for the uptake of carbon in ecosystems, soils, or trees. So early action gives more benefits. And finally, it also takes time for education and um, capacity building and training so that the practices are learned and can be implemented. And there are these reasons why early action is particularly important in the land sector. Just, uh, to talk very specifically to that question is what are the key messages for policymakers from this report? The first is it really underscores the big message of the 1.5 report, that there is no option but for a rapid reduction in, in global emissions. And that's something I think which is repeated throughout the report. But it also calls out very important implications for government and governance. It talks to the fact that our current governments are structured in silos and that we need better integration within governments because of the complexity of the land question. 
It also talks to us about the fact that every scale of action needs to be connected. So literally from the farm up to the UN headquarters need to be interacting with one another. And again, that challenges existing systems. Importantly, it calls out very strongly the importance of investment. You know, when governments think about where they put their money, they are not always necessarily thinking about land at the front of the queue, but this calls out land as a very important opportunity in terms of investing in sustainable land management, investing in land restoration. So it talks to governments about where they put funds and the decisions they take about that. But it also sends a very important signal to governments that they've agreed on a sustainable development framework currently anchored in the SDGs. And that becomes increasingly out of reach if we don't act ambitiously on land towards that overall objective of reducing emissions and increasing adaptive capacity. So there are some very strong messages that come out of section C and D for, for governments. Thanks, and we've got quite a few questions from people following this remotely, so I'd like to take some of those now. Uh, from Seth uh, Borenstein of, of VAP, and this is directed at Yuba Sokana, but others may want to come in too. If the world continues on current pathways for emissions, population, and inequality, what will the situation with food security be like in 2050, 2070, and 2100? How much worse than now? Would you consider it a crisis or not much different? Well, certainly this has been uh, addressed in the uh, 1.5 report as well as in the uh, land report. And then those are related to what has been uh, uh, just uh, indicated in terms of early actions. And we start acting now by uh, scaling up uh, some of the uh, 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 existing solutions on uh, addressing this issue in uh, different uh, uh, front uh, related to uh, the food uh, systems, related to agricultural practice, related also to the energy systems. But uh, it's also indicated uh, the, uh, the, the cost related to uh, those different actions if we are not acting as soon as possible, because we cannot delay, any delay will uh, be uh, uh, the, to, to face the issue will be challenging. And then those are some of the indications that uh, came to complement what has been already uh, said in the 1.5 report, uh, uh, special report. Yes, I also want to flag that there are high returns for early action. For instance, many sustainable land management technologies and practices are profitable within three to 10 years. Another example is uh, the high returns on investments in human and institutional capacities, for instance, for early warning systems. We here in WMO headquarters, WMO is warning, working with countries on these early warning systems for extreme weather events. There's potential for improving the use of seasonal forecasts, which are critical for food security, for instance. So these are examples of actions that can be taken now, build on science and reduce risk, manage risk to avoid managing crisis. While we are on uh, this uh, the issue of the near term, the, the real consideration uh, in uh, the near term uh, is uh, about the institutions uh, building. And uh, I think what, what one finds, uh, you, as you would read uh, uh, the, uh, the, the report, uh, that, that the institutions are the ones where uh, you can reduce uh, a great deal of transaction costs. Uh, and uh, the, the cost of transactions uh, for not only for, for any new areas which are coming up uh, requires building very quickly the new institutions, for instance, actually that, that we are reaping some benefits of uh, and huge benefits of instituting uh, uh, IPCC about uh, 30 years back. And so this uh, is also, it's not an alarming uh, issue or something that, that, that has to be solved tomorrow is an, is an issue. The real issue is that, that well, how do we look this uh, into a larger frame uh, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, go into the right direction uh, with uh, the minimum cost. Uh, while, while I am on uh, the, the issue of the, the, the dietary choice, uh, I don't want to say much, uh, but I would say that I belong to India. 
and the, the debate there on, uh, on, on this would average out uh, anything which would be, be, be going in some direction uh, for, I mean, so this is just as an, uh, as an aside, uh, please don't take that as an off a formal. Uh, uh. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think Valerie mentioned uh, early warning systems and uh, because I represent WMO, uh, this always remains uh, in the heart of everyone in this building and all in that community. So uh, 1.5 reports that every choice matters and this spirit continues on the land report and WMO picks up on that and say every life matters. So for us, the business of alerting people and providing them with the weather climate services and warnings it's day-to-day -day challenge in the changing climate. So understanding land, uh, which, which comes out from this report, not only helps us to improve our models and to have better predictability, but also helps us to understand which kind of climate and weather services sectors might have to realize the options which this report outlines. Just for instance, few examples, just very, very small examples, WMO does run early warning systems for sand and dust, so desertification and uh, air pollution was never, uh, uh, never uh, new. But with the changing situation right now and with, with how this report characterizes the trends in, in the land behavior and the climate system, it helps us to know where we would first thing first need to deploy these early warning systems so that people potentially affected or those who are starting to be affected would be, would be alerted. The, the other completely opposite, completely different component of WMO multiple operational work is that we do measure all atmospheric constituencies, and that is also the basis of WMO reports which feed into IPCC assessment. Well, one thing we understood, we can help countries to understand themselves what are the fluxes, well, how effective are the practices which they use in the land here and there, how they can measure themselves the effect of this. So WMO methodology or how to measure emissions greenhouse gas in particular, and pollutants, and how to use models is not a rocket science. We have created methodology which every country, even city or the, or the smaller region, can use to see where they were before and where they are now as they implement this tactic. So it's very, very good uh, motivation and stimulus. What, just two examples. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. I think there was a question at the back there, please. Yes, good morning. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions, please. Uh, Lisa Schlein, Voice of America. Uh, I see that none of you are willing to tell me that I should become a vegan, but I would like to ask you whether you think it would help the planet were I to eat broccoli instead of a rib steak. And then if you would uh, comment on something that you said in your report regarding food waste and its impact upon climate change. And then lastly, you also indicate that the developing countries in Africa, Asia, and so forth will bear the brunt of the impact of climate change. So I'd like to know what recommendations you have, what role the uh, richer countries have to play in helping uh, the poorer countries adapt to, um, well, better, better land usage to adapt to climate change. Does it involve giving more money? Perhaps you have a figure in mind and also transfer technology. Thank you. Thank you. So who wants to start with that? Hans, yeah. Thank you. Maybe to get the language right in reply to your, to your question, if you would tell us that your personal decisions, decision is to reduce the number of, of ribs that you want to consume and rather move, move to a plant-based diet, everybody on the podium would probably tell you, well, that's a good decision. And you will help the planet reduce greenhouse gas emissions because you are the reducing uh, the need to grow cattle to the extent that is currently being grown. This will, will contribute to reduce uh, methane um, emissions. And emissions is really a key, key part, key part of, of the story and, and uh, a key provides considering those and how they can be reduced is a key guideline in any decision to be made at the policy level and at the individual level. So your carbon footprint should be, should be of concern. 
and and uh, uh, this is certainly setting the the general framing and it's also setting the framing for the the wider question uh, you are asking about the vulnerable countries and how to help their adaptation well there there is an international finance mechanism that has been discussed and that is being established uh, to to help adaptation but one f one message is coming out of the ipcc assessment reports adaptation and mitigation have to go together there is no possibility for anybody to say oh climate change is happen and then happening and then we just adapt to it the capacity to adapt is limited and uh, it, it certainly depends on the process, it de depends on the region and so forth, and there are some regions and some, some places, especially in the low latitudes where vulnerability is extreme. And even in those countries, when there is an emph emphasis on adaptation in, the, in their development strategies, mitigation should, should play a key, a key role. Thank you. Thank you. Another question from outside. This is from Meg, uh, Megan Rowling of the Thomson Reuters Foundation. Please could you expand on how more sustainable use of land can help reduce poverty in countries on the front lines of climate change impacts and what are the most important actions that could enhance poverty reduction? Deborah, do you want to start with that? And, and I think I don't think we fully answered the question from Voice of America, so I think there's some overlap with that. There was in fact very extensive discussion in this room about the relationship between land management and the kind of inequity we see at the global level. And if we look to the options presented in the summary for policymakers, certainly there are elements involved around technology transfer. So we see increasing pressures of land degradation, desertification in places like Africa, Asia, um, and South America. And so the sharing of, of technologies uh, in that regard was important. The importance of government support was also called out. So it's not only about um, a cooperation between the North and the South, but also about governments supporting uh, local land managers to improve the, the, the way they manage land and make that more sustainable. An important element within that discussion was the ability for smallholders to access credit. So the importance of accessing financial resources to be able to change the way you manage the land uh, is important. A very big message which is stressed um, in this report and again is a conti uh, continuum uh, from the 1.5 report is the importance about efforts to reduce poverty um, and with the view of eradicating poverty. So any investment in poverty eradication is an important option globally which underpins the ability um, to uh, improve land management. So investment in uh, eradicating poverty is also an important uh, element. Discussions in the SBM in terms of the options available include market and non-market support to uh, local farmers as important opportunities again to deal with the challenges, particularly in the global south, where there are high levels of inequity and poverty. Yeah, Valerie. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to flag one, one aspect coming out of uh, climate science and climate modeling. It's the fact that if greenhouse gas emissions continue to increase or do not decrease, then uh, many regions, especially in the tropics, um, would see novel unprecedented climatic conditions in terms of mean temperature, but also seasonal cycles or extreme events. So the report stresses the importance of preparing for that and working on, uh, for instance, uh, crops that are uh, resilient to extreme heat or drought. And uh, in relationship with sustainable land management, the report looks at a number of options that are diverse and are context specific, but they include, for instance, agroecology, conservation agriculture or forestry practices, diversity of species, rotations of species, organic farming, um, conservation of pollinators, um, rainwater harvesting, range and pasture management, and precision agriculture systems. So th this shows the diversity of options that have been assessed by the authors based on existing knowledge. Thank you, Hans. Yeah, thank you. And, and just to, to add to this, and the spectrum of options that we're talking about, uh, they, they actually also reflect that in each of those options we have to consider 
the capacity of that option to whether it works and under which climate conditions it, it will work. This limits the degree to which we can allow climate change uh, to happen in, in order to maintain the, the full capacity. We see a shift uh, in climate zones towards higher latitudes. We see a shift in species and in ecosystems towards higher, higher latitudes. We see negative impacts on, on, on biodiversity and ecosystems along the way. And I think ecosystems and biodiversity conservation um, and, and the, the constraints on that are actually sending us messages where the limits to adaptation are in the natural systems. And they could be a good like guideline for us as humans as we are part of the natural systems. We depend on them. We depend on the ecosystem services. And, and we are also, as a species, exposed to conditions in, in some areas of the planet already that, that, beyond, that are beyond those that are amenable to human life. So we may also be losing habitat in the future depending on, on climate conditions. All of this pr presents a guideline and, and indicates urgent action would take us and near-term action would take us into a better future. Thank you. Huber. I just want to uh, flag what, uh, on what uh, um, Debra indicated in addition to capacity building to finance through a different mechanism that uh, already exists and also technology transfer, institutional uh, integration, the importance and uh, that has been uh, uh, highlighted in the report of inequality as one of the uh, problem for poverty alleviation and uh, uh, increasing the uh, uh, finding solution to the problem, and then uh, also the social safety net, and then those are some of the elements that are important related to uh, poverty eradication, related also to improving the uh, uh, condition in degraded land, particularly in the context of Africa. Thank you. In, in the fourth row there, please. Yes, Juliette from uh, Nikkei, Japanese uh, newspaper. Um, the report really highlights the importance of better land management and also non-deforestation and how it can help to reduce temperature. Uh, right now in Brazil, we have a new example of a, a new land management, I would say, uh, related with the Amazonian forest, and we all know that it's one of the lungs of the planet. How the IPCC would see this new forest management? Is it aligned with the report and what you're highlighting? Volunteers? Yeah, Hans. There is one simple answer to this. It contradicts all of the messages that are coming out of the report. Thanks. Then in the, in the front row, please. Uh, Boris Engelson, a freelancer. I have three very short questions. One, what about this region which could benefit from warming, that is, Siberia or Antarctica? Second question, uh, water. Uh, warming uh, means drought or flood for farmers, but on the average it means more water in the clouds. What will be the impact of that layer, thicker layer of clouds as compared to the impact of the thicker layer of CO2? And third question, why uh, Mr. Uh, Jian Liu, chief scientist, has withdrawn from the panel? Okay, well maybe Valerie or Panama want to start off with the first, the first couple of questions. Say, uh, I was saying, uh, in a warmer climate condition, they, some regions, maybe uh, in cold regions, can temporarily benefit from, you know, for 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 the food production. But at the same time, we should also consider, under the warmer climate, and uh, uh, what will be the rainfall, support of the agriculture, and what will be the pest outbreaks. Mm -hmm. So we should put all them together to consider 
mm. what will be the impact mm. for the highlighted regions. Yeah. So that's uh, very complicated. But in general, uh, warmer climate gave us longer growing season and uh, uh, can be beneficial for the, for, for the food production. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, the report show, shows clearly that in some regions there'll be a longer growing season, but in high latitude regions, warming is projected to increase disturbance in boreal forests, including drought, wildfire, and pest outbreaks. And you also have to balance that with implications for permafrost thaw and degradation. And the report under preparation on ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate that is prepared for release in September 25, I think, uh, has a specific chapter on polar regions, with, um, which will also uh, provide um, um, an updated state of knowledge specific to polar regions north and south. Thank you. Jan, Jan Liu had another urgent appointment at the start of the press conference, uh, so he didn't come up to the podium, so he didn't want to interrupt things as they were going, but, but he's joined us now. Thank you. Um, so I have a question from Stephanie Neberhai of Reuters, please. There it is, sorry. Thank you. Um, just going back to the question on Brazil, uh, I wanted to ask about how is it that the word Amazon does not appear at all in this report? Was that a result of uh, lobbying by the uh, Brazilian delegation? And then also the, um, the report does not make any references to tipping points. Is that because we're beyond that? Thank you. Uh, Valerie? With respect to uh, specific references to regions, um, there was a wish to provide a better coverage of um, the implications of a warming climate for many regions in South America. And so in many situations we refer to South America because it's not just the Amazon that is affected by a changing climate, it's many other regions and it's upon request from delegates of these other uh, countries in South America that we have expanded in fact uh, the reference to South America. Thanks. Yes, any other question on the tipping points, please? Yeah, sorry, yeah. So the report makes references to uh, aspects related to irreversible loss in some situations, but it's nuanced in terms of which level of global warming is associated with which specific risks. There's a gradient of levels of warming. So um, the summary for policymakers does not refer, I don't think, specifically to tipping points, but to specific risks and how risks increase with each additional level of warming. And if you, you remember in the 1.5 report, we were quite clear on that by saying every bit of warming matters, every half a degree of warming matters. So we cannot assess specific at the global scale levels of warming associated with overall tipping points. We are more explicit in addressing specific risks and how they relate with the level of glo global warming. Thank you. Now we only have five or ten minutes left, so I'd like to take a qu question from the back of the side, please. Thank you so much for considering looking at this side of the room. Um, I have two questions and I want to ask them in French, as I would like uh, to get an answer in French, if it might be possible. So I'm looking at maybe Valérie Masson-Delmotte, uh, but anyone else uh, would be fine too. Uh, two questions. Uh, sur les terres arables, uh, est-ce que, à la lumière de ce que dit votre rapport sur la, la, la dégradation des terres, est-ce que l'on peut dire que uh, les terres arables, les terres de bonne qualité, peuvent être en voie de disparition ou pourront l'être si l'on euh, continue euh, cette forme d'agriculture conventionnelle Ça, c'est la première question. La deuxième question, c'est sur les agrocarburants, les biocarburants. Je ne sais pas quel est le terme le plus approprié. Vous en parlez dans le rapport en disant, en rappelant qu'ils peuvent être en concurrence avec, euh, avec, euh, avec la... la les aliments, ce que l'on cultive. Donc est-ce que le GIEC, vous ne prenez pas position sur le, le régime alimentaire que l'on doit adopter, mais est-ce que vous prenez une position plus claire sur les agrocarburants en disant c'est effectivement, à la lumière de ce que l'on sait aujourd'hui, ce n'est pas forcément une solution viable et ils peuvent représenter euh, une partie du problème plutôt qu'une partie de la solution. Merci. Valérie. 
Euh, donc je vais répondre en français, mais mon, euh, mon ami Yuba Sokona peut également le faire. Euh, donc sur la question des terres arables, nous montrons à quel point elles sont sous pression aujourd'hui euh, du fait par exemple de pratiques qui augmentent l'érosion des sols. Euh, cette érosion des sols augmente également dans un climat qui change, en particulier euh, par exemple sous l'effet d'événements de précipitations intensifiées dans certaines régions. Donc c'est un phénomène qui contribue à, à l'érosion des sols. Et enfin ces, ces terres arables, elles sont également sous pression, euh, en particulier par euh, l'expansion des zones urbaines. C'est un point que nous soulignons dans ce résumé pour décideurs euh, et, et voilà donc ces pressions multiples s'exercent sur les terres arables donc nous montrons à quel point il est important euh, de considérer euh, toutes ces pressions y compris euh, un climat qui change, une population qui augmente euh, euh, dans la conservation euh, de la qualité des sols et l'amélioration de la qualité des sols puisqu'on peut également améliorer la qualité des sols hein, par euh, de bonnes pratiques de gestion durable. Sur la question des agrocarburants, ils sont abordés dans ce rapport à l'angle de la bioénergie, c'est le terme euh, anglophone que nous utilisons. Et euh, le rapport est très clair hein, sur euh, les enjeux, apportés, les solutions qui peuvent être présentées par euh, l'utilisation de la bioénergie d'une manière soutenable, intégrée dans une gestion durable des terres, en substitut par exemple à l'utilisation d'énergie fossile ou combinée au captage et stockage du CO2 pour éliminer et stocker de manière durable du CO2 de l'atmosphère. Donc cela fait partie d'un portfolio de solutions possibles nécessaire pour contenir le réchauffement à un niveau bas, mais nous montrons à quel point euh, l'importance des surfaces cultivées pour produire cette bio biomasse peut être une pression supplémentaire sur l'utilisation des terres. Et donc nous apportons des éléments précis par rapport aux risques associés aux surfaces euh, potentiellement cultivé pour produire davantage de biomasse pour les carburants. Et enfin, à l'intérieur du rapport, il y a également des éléments plus précis concernant par exemple des analyses en cycle de vie, puisque les bénéfices associés à l'utilisation de la biomasse dépendent également d'une analyse plus complète depuis la production jusqu'à la consommation, donc une analyse en cycle de vie complète, même en termes d'émissions. Je voudrais tout simplement insister sur le fait que le GIEC ne prend pas position. Le GIEC également ne donne pas un avis en disant que telle solution est la plus viable, telle solution il faut se diriger vers là. On l'a répété, on l'a dit et redit, on ne fait pas de recommandations, on ne prend pas position. On ne donne pas d'indication sur notre préférence, on donne l'état de la situation en fonction, euh, notamment de ce qui a été indiqué tout à l'heure par Valérie sur euh, l'utilisation des, des terres, sur les compétitions entre la production de, euh, de, 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 de bioénergie et la production alimentaire, euh, dans un contexte bien spécifique en, en fonction de la littérature existante. Je pense qu'il faudrait que le, les médias puissent euh, se saisir de cela. Nous ne faisons pas de recommandations, nous ne donnons pas également de directives à suivre et nous, donnons, nous produisons l'état des connaissances sur des situations bien précises. Thank you. Now we're really near the end of our time and I just wanted to remind you that um, the, you can find the summary for policymakers that's been presented today and the press release and indeed the full report uh, other documentation on the IPCC website, ipcc.ch. And uh, I'm sorry that we haven't been able to take all the questions in the room or indeed that have come in remotely, uh, but we'll be presenting this report um, in, in many parts of the world in the coming weeks and months. So hopefully some of you will have the opportunity to uh, raise questions there. But I'd like to finish with one question from Eric Holthaus of Rolling Stone. What did it feel like for the authors to put this report together personally and emotionally at a time when it's clear that, quote, rapid and far-reaching transitions in all aspects of society, according to the words of the IPCC SR15 needed. So, volunteers for that, Jim, maybe. Well, uh, the, au the authors are actually in the audience, and I see them looking uh, bright-eyed and optimistic and ready to apply all their efforts to the near-term actions that we identified in Section D of the, of the summary for, for, for policymakers. We know about the huge challenges of, of climate change, but I don't think we want to get a, over a message of despair. We want to get over a message that all actions do make a difference, and that's 
that was very much part of the 1.5 report. And just to emphasise as co-chairs, we are incredibly grateful for the efforts that the authors put in on this, both in the two years leading to this, uh, th this press conference and during the last six days, where the efforts have lis uh, risen to new levels in terms of completing the summary for policymakers. Thank you, Valerie. Yeah, I just want to remind everybody that the authors are volunteers. They do that in addition to their research activity in their own research centers or universities or teaching duties. And I think they expressed at the end of the approval session um, how uh, also the approval, the co-design process that's part of the IPCC helps them understand better the needs of society. And by doing the assessment of the state of knowledge, they contribute to the maturation of science. They identify knowledge gaps, which will be stimulating also to produce new knowledge in the future. And finally, my perception of the approval session was a sense of seriousness on both the sides of the authors and the side of the delegates. Thank you very much. Anyone else want to come in before we say goodbye? Okay, well, thank, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, we'll be, you'll be seeing us again soon or hearing from us again soon because on the 25th of September, we'll be releasing the special report on the ocean and cryosphere and a changing climate. That will be done in Monaco. And there'll be a press conference on the 25th of September. So look forward to seeing you there.